I want to talk a little bit about how this medium, digital media, short form documentary, can inspire, engage, and connect with students so that they can understand cultural, social, and environmental issues from around the world a little bit better. As a filmmaker, I'm always thinking about stories. Not just about my craft as a filmmaker, what makes a good story, or how to tell a good story, how to create a narrative arc, how to build characters, working with conflict and resolution, the tools for telling a good story. I find myself thinking about a more fundamental question. What are stories? And why do we need them? And in our fast-paced, complex world, what role do they play? We've been telling stories since the beginning. Every culture on Earth tells stories. It's part of our DNA. Always has been and always will be. Without stories, where would we be? Who would we be? They have and continue to define us. They allow us to question the world around us, to create narratives to try and understand our lives. Through stories, we can share wisdom and knowledge, beauty and poetry, turmoil, suffering, and pain. They can reveal core universal values, share emotional experiences, offer profound ideas, and express the contradictions that define our very human nature. They entertain us. They make us laugh. They make us cry. They make us think. They can connect us to a world much bigger than our own and help us to make sense of it. Now, more than ever, we need stories to help us make sense of the world around us, to understand the complex issues we hear about every day in the news, issues that our children and students are also bombarded with and are trying to understand. The scale of the problems and issues we face, climate change, poverty, food insecurity, to name a few, can sometimes feel overwhelming. The problems are so complex, so large, it is often hard to comprehend. Every day, we are bombarded with so much information about these problems and issues, be they environmental, social, cultural, or political, more information than we can ever absorb and even if we do absorb it, how do we process it? How do we process and understand this information? Or do we end up ignoring it, dismissing it, and saying it's not part of my world? But stories can cut through the barrage of information and touch us. They can help us connect to and understand the world around us to put a human face to these issues and create a human emotional connection. And if we have that human emotional connection, we begin to care a bit more. And I truly believe that if we want our children and our students to understand and engage with a complex issue like climate change or food insecurity, we need them to care, to feel, and to connect with this on an emotional, human level. One of the things that made me want to become a documentary filmmaker was the desire I had to put a human face to the issues I was hearing about on the radio, reading in the newspaper, or watching on the nightly news. I felt so disconnected to so much of what I was hearing or reading, and I wanted to connect to it, to feel it, to truly understand it, and to share that with others. 
I wanted to inspire people to connect to a world much bigger than their immediate environment. I wanted to tell stories, what I call the edges of the world, far away from the bright lights and noise of the city. Stories that weren't being told in mainstream media, made up of voices and perspectives that I wasn't hearing. I wanted to use the multi-sensory aspect of film to create an experience that would transport people to other cultures and create an awareness of global issues from the inside out through feeling and empathy. For more than 10 years, I've traveled the world documenting how cultures and people are being impacted by development, globalization, and environmental destruction. And as you'll see in some of the films I'm going to share, this was often in small communities, a few families, people trying to live their lives in the places they have always known as home. And in all the time I spent in these places, one of the things that struck me most was the dignity these people have while coping with the uncertainty they are living in. Yes, there is anger and despair, but there is also resilience, inspiration, and hope. And I feel that this story is just as important to tell as the negative side of the story, the fear, the loss, and the destruction we hear so much about. Now, over the last decade, a very interesting revolution has been taking place in how we tell and share stories. Affordable digital filmmaking equipment and the internet transformed how filmmakers like myself could tell and share stories. We no longer only had to make films that fit within the traditional mold, feature length, or 30 minute or hour long TV slots. We could create shorter films quickly at low cost and share them with a global audience through the emerging digital platforms that quickly formed. A few years ago, a film that would have taken months or years to make and distributed through traditional mediums of television or DVD could now be made quickly. And these films could now be shared and distributed online almost instantaneously. This was incredibly exciting to me, and I quickly jumped into the world of short form digital filmmaking directing and producing dozens of short films for online distribution. And one of the most interesting things that happened was how the films found their way into the hands of teachers. Teachers began using these films in their classrooms, middle and high school classrooms, college classrooms, adult education, using them as teaching tools and entry points into understanding issues and exploring subjects. And as I started hearing how these teachers were using these films, I began to realize how powerful this digital medium of short form documentary is for connecting students to the world around them. A character driven human exploration of these issues could quickly and emotionally connect students to complex issues. This is the power of short form documentary digital storytelling. It can connect you immediately to an issue or an idea, a place or a person, and transport you there. But that's just the beginning. It's what happens after that's really exciting. When a film becomes alive in the hands of teachers and students, in a discussion or class activity, the story becomes a gateway into deeper and reflective learning. The exploration of an issue or, an, or a subject is rooted in the human emotional experience shared in the film. In the end, that's what a story like this should be, a gateway, an opening into something much deeper and profound. As a filmmaker, that's what I'm trying to do, to create that opening, to create a connection to our shared human experience so that we can understand the world a little better and how it's both much bigger and smaller than we think. So I'd like to share, oh, thank you. 
I'd like to share three films with you that illustrate what I just talked about. And for each film that I make, I always ask myself a question. It becomes the driving force of how I create that story. It's how I find my characters. It's how I find a place where the story will unfold. And what I think about as I try and connect with the people who are in this story. Now, the first film I want to share is set in the Alaskan Yukon Delta, on the edge of the Bering Sea, in a little fishing village populated by the Yupik Native Americans who've lived there for millennia. Uh, and this community is dependent on salmon for its way of life, for its livelihood, and its food source. And in the last couple of decades, this food source has been slowly disappearing. So I wanted to try and understand what it was like. So I spent some time up there a few summers ago with a grandfather teaching his grandsons how to fish. It's called Yukon Kings. Where's the fish? Yeah, I've been fishing all my life. In fact, I used to fish with my dad. Three grandchildren. We've been blessed by our children to help us out. The one gear left jackets don't get. Every one of my grandkids since they were small, they've been with me in the camp. Don't forget the rubber gloves. But they all work, even the littlest ones. Young, every fish was like uh, 30 pounds. But now, you're lucky if you get um, 18 pound or 15 pound king. Nobody can explain that. But they can guess, they can talk. Right now, for subsistence, average person can take maybe 10 kings and they're satisfied. Simon is a way of our life. I hope it doesn't go away. I remember when I was growing up, I used to hear elders will talk. They said, people will change, the weather will change. It's true, I see it now. 
There's no stopping it. It's hard. For our younger people, it's very hard. You gotta have that money to pay for the gas. You gotta have a gas to go out and try to get your subsistence. If there's no more salmon, there will be no more work I know. Yeah, I take my grandchildren about fishing. I teach them how to check net and how to set net and uh, how to use the current. Them something they can remember. But we're not going to be around forever. We'll be gone. How they used long time ago. No cooking pot, they cook it up in open fire. Serve each cup of noodles. So far, they're, they're okay, grandchildren. But we're not there all the time to watch them. I know my grandchildren will teach their kids to how to fish. They will. I know they will. Thank you. Thank you. So this next film, uh, you know, began with me asking this question. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes climate change can feel like a very abstract issue. There's some place in the world where it isn't, but for the most part, here in America, it, it, it still is. Um, and so I found a place deep in the bayous of Louisiana, um, an island that is slowly disappearing and sinking into the sea. For those of you who have seen Beasts of the Southern Wild, the beautiful Academy-nominated film by Ben Zeitlin, um, this island and the people who call it home served as the inspiration for that film. It's the real-life Beasts of the Southern Wild. So I went down there and spent some time with the few people who still live on the island asking this question. And this film is called The Ile de Jean Charles. Go walking around here and over there. Yep.
My name is Edison Dodo, and I'm from the island. My grandpa was here, my dad was here, I'm here. So we've been on the island for a long, long, long time. Could I still do the same thing what I was doing when I was 10 years old? We talk, we laugh. You catch them front? In the 60s, stuff like that, we didn't have no water. That island was green, green, green. We used to play in the tree, play like Tarzan, stuff like that. Now in the 70s, after they cut the pipeline, we started having our water in the yard. Now that was a mistake they made. I guess they thought they were doing something good, they did something bad. From here to Pointe de it was all, all grass. Now it's all water. When we're now we're young, but maybe 250 half, maybe 300 half. Now maybe 20. We used to have a church down there. We used to have a store, a grocery store. We used to have all of that. My name is Chris Brunet. I'm a lifelong resident of uh, a Jean Charles, or in French, as we would say, Lille de Jean Charles. Before this house was built and my parents married, this used to be a garden that my grandfather used to tend. It's nice to see my, my, my grandfather um, tilling the garden like this, you know? Looking at these pictures with all these trees in, in the yard, uh, the landscape has, has changed so much. This goes to show you how, how high the water is. It's actually over the front of the hood of this, this truck right here. That, that was something to see with, with the squalls that day there. So the whole area just, just looked like a lake. I decided to, to make a change in me whenever I, I noticed the, the trees I grew up playing uh, under were dying. Just in this yard right here, I believe I could count up to 15 trees that was in the yard that's not there anymore. With the trees dying and the water uh, coming in more and more, it seemed like a smaller storm was always getting stronger. It just got to the point to where it was uh, almost two storms in one. Say like Katrina and Rita, that was a month apart. And then Gustav and Ike, which was a week apart. After Rita, yeah, it was a bad hurricane for over here. And they said, the island gonna be gone in two years best for y'all to move off the island. Because y'all not going to have no more island in two years from now. And me, I stand up, I say, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Only God is going to know when that island going to disappear. The only real challenge, you know, to live down here is, is whenever you got a storm coming and you don't know if you're coming home to something or not. It's heartbreaking, you know, you come back home after a storm and if it's still standing, you know, you're grateful. But some homes just can't be lived in. What you see at the island now is just a skeleton of what it used to be. The 
A lot of people, after a hurricane, they leave, they don't come back. I don't like to see the people leave me. I don't like for them to stay. If the hurricane finished today, I'm ready to come tomorrow. I'm going to stay right here, born and raised here, and I'm going to stay here. That's my town. If the island can stay as it is, I believe we're gonna we can be okay. But but you know, with anything, you know, there, there's no telling what could happen. I know that every year that my home, that, that my community, you know, we have a challenge. Okay, Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. I got to go shopping with my grandma and I got to see my uncle and Julie. And please bless people that are not as fortunate as us. And amen. 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 Very good, my baby. Very good. Yes, I'm living in, in an area where, where, you know, I'm prone to hurricanes. But nowadays, who's not prone to hurricanes? But once the storm passes and the grass is back green again and all of this here, it's back to the way, you know, that, that I see Jean Charles. And so for me, you know, it's home. So the last uh, film I want to share with you uh, started for me, I, I flipped open a, a National Geographic and inside was a, a look at all the languages around the world that were disappearing, many on a monthly basis almost, um, and the diversity that was being lost. And I asked myself, what would it be like to be the last speaker of a language? And I found one closer to home than I would have imagined uh, here in the Central Valley. Believe it or not, in California, there are more at-risk languages than anywhere else in the country, almost anywhere else in the world. Uh, indigenous languages that thrived here for thousands of years that are now endangered. So this is the story of the last speaker of the Wukchumni language and the efforts she under, has undergone to try and keep her language alive. It's called Marie's Dictionary. That's Marie and her daughter, Jennifer. My name is uh, Marie Wilcox. My grandmother delivered me Thanksgiving Day 
on November 24th, 1933. <laughs> we only had a little one-room house. Grandpa and Grandma always spoke our language with Germany. I just didn't hear my grandma speak too much English. Go, go, go! Hey! Mom <laughs> is our last fluent speaker now since my dad's uncle, Felix Aicho, passed away. <laughs> when I was growing up, I spoke English. I don't remember hearing mom speaking the Wok Chumney language. Mom worked in the fields. We picked a lot of fruit. And I think I missed a lot of school, but I don't know for sure. I left my Indian language behind when my grandma died. I didn't speak the language anymore until um, my sisters started to teach the kids. Hearing the girls try to speak their language again made me want to learn again. And uh, I started remembering. I was very surprised she could remember all that from her age, young age that uh, her grandmother had left her. She just started writing down her words on envelopes and papers, you know. And so she'd sit up night after night, typing on the computer, which she was never a computer person. I'm just a pecker, I, one word at a time. And uh, I was slow. Just peck, peck, peck. So when I had all these words together, I thought it would be a good idea to try to make a dictionary. I didn't say that I wanted to save it for anybody else to learn. I just wanted to get it together. Every morning I'd, you know, uh, have my coffee and uh, have a sandwich or make me oatmeal or whatever. And uh, then I'd get right on that. It took many years for her to do this dictionary. She loved doing it. She would work many hours late at night and get up and work on it during the day. And uh, the X sound. Oh, that's the hardest one for everybody. <laughs> Is they don't have hell. One. I've been working with hell. mom on this dictionary for all the years, and I've helped her a lot. The A right here. Oh, there. Oh my gosh. Anyway, the TR sound and the CH sound sounds a little bit alike to me, but uh, I know. I know. Uh, tashish. Tashish. Uh huh. Got it? I, I got mean, it. Uh. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very frustrating <laughs> because she, she wanted to make sure I knew how to say the words right. So if I would say something and she can't hear that well, that's not how I said it. You know, I would kind of get scolded. We got to go through this whole thing again because I didn't like the sentences. They didn't make sense to me. Oh, it just seemed like it would take forever. I am very surprised that we've gotten as far as we have. Do you want your jacket? Yeah. Can you, you Lake, ocean, sea, paasi. Paasi my dupchin. Leaf, tap tap. 
Me and my grandson are uh, trying to record our dictionary from uh, A to Z. Uh, learn. The whole Ooh. dictionary took me about seven years. So <laughs> that was a lot of work for me. Language, talk, speak, kahai. Kahia men kahai. See, I'm uncertain about my language and uh, who wants to keep it alive. Just a few. No one seems to want to learn. It's sad. Well, it just uh, seems weird that I am the last one. And uh, I don't know, it just... It'll just be gone when he says, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it might go on and on. I think she has a little confidence in me. <laughs> And, but I know she has more confidence in Donovan because the way he's really connecting with her and, and, and learning the language so fast because I've been working on it all these years, you know, and I haven't been able to speak with her like he does. Um, uh, my role, I feel, is to archive it all make sure that it gets documented and put somewhere to where 100 years from now our families will be able to access and to be able to speak. And it will keep going with me and daughter Ben, I know. <laughs> Thank you. So a few years ago, after I've been making these films and connecting with other filmmakers from around the world who are also engage in this short form digital storytelling revolution, if you will, um, I wanted to find a platform to share them. Uh, and not just YouTube and Vimeo and all the other outlets we were working with, but a platform that would be designed for educators to use these stories in their classrooms. So we launched the Global Oneness Project, because these are global stories that ask us to think of the world in a more interconnected way, and how we might learn and exchange with people from places we might never go to, or experiencing things we might not experience ourselves, but through the stories we can connect and understand. Um, so we can bring the world to your classroom. And what we've done is pair these stories with lesson plans, so that teachers have material to take these stories and use them in their classrooms. They can use them in their entirety, or they can take them uh, and integrate them into already established course curricula. They're standards-based, they're common core-based. They're designed to help get the conversation going, to engage in critical thinking, reflective learning. And the subjects they cover really runs the gamut, as you can see. English and the humanities, history and social sciences, cultural anthropology, environmental science, and the arts. They're all free, no ads, and they're available to anybody 
would like to use them. So, thank you. So you can visit the website, you can download these lesson plans, you can view them on the site, you can share them, and hopefully you'll use them and share them with your networks. So I have a few minutes left and I wanted to open it up for questions to anyone in the audience. So we have a mic here. So if you have a question about anything about the films, about what we do, uh, please raise your hand. Don't be shy. Um, I was curious about how you came up with the questions. And obviously, you were inspired by the media that you'd seen in uh, magazines. Um, but as a teacher, coming up with a question that would m inspire students to answer that question with a documentary in a multitude of ways is what I would love to do. And so how would you suggest going about creating a question like oh, you did? I mean, one of the things that the lesson plans that are created to accompany these stories do is they kind of do that work for you, or at least they at least get things going so that you might be inspired by the question that is written on the lesson plan and come up with your own. But there, there are a lot of questions there, just like the questions that I came up through in my process to help facilitate the process in the classroom. Can you describe that process of coming up with that question? For the lesson plan or for the film? For yourself, yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, I have too many questions. That's my problem. You know, I wake up in the morning and I have a thousand questions, and the more that I listen to and the more that I watch and the more that I talk or the more that I listen, I have more questions. So I'm a curious person, and I'm curious about what's happening in the world. And when I come up with a question, I try and think, what is, what is a simple way of starting that process, of that process of exploration? How can I root my exploration in something that's simple, that is not um, you know, going to project what I think I'm going to learn or understand on that question? How can I take it back to a simple base? What is home in the concept of a changing world? It's even broader than climate change. The world is changing. What is my home? mean in that change in reality. And I start there. So that when I go out and talk with people who are living in that world, I start from a simple re receptive place. To me, the most important thing about being a filmmaker is being a listener. Um, if you can't listen, then you can't tell a story. That's my kind of guiding light when I'm out there um, in the field. I have to listen first and let what I'm learning from the people who are Essentially, the storytellers, I'm just interpreting that, you know, guide my exploration. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, over here. It's very inspiring to see um, the questions that you ask, and we experience that in the classroom with our kids as well. And I was curious if um, you already have a platform or might be considering a platform for kids to submit questions to your site that might be further explored. We will be launching that next year. That's something we're going to be doing. Um, we're actually going to be collaborating with the New York Times on something to do with that in the ne next few months. They have this new platform um, around the films. Some of these films premiered on the New York Times first, and they are launching a film club which um, is going to be exploring that. We're going to be hopefully working with them. But in addition to that, we're going to be really pushing the interaction between teachers and students and students and students on our platform, asking these questions, responding to the stories, and engaging with each other. So definitely, you can look for that in the coming months. Awesome. I think when we look at you, we might see our students in you, and it's very inspiring. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Emmanuel, piggybacking on that one question there, can you just give us a short version? You're a high school kid about ready to launch uh, from high school. How do you try, how do you, what's your path to now becoming a filmmaker in this genre here? That's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I was a high school dropout, so I'm probably the poorest example of what trajectory you could take. Um, <laughs> uh, no, uh, you know, um, what I would say is that you know, the, the, the track you can take to becoming a filmmaker, I think, is very different than it was 10 years ago. I feel like you can take the traditional route and go and study film in, in, in university, and that is going to be a tremendously valuable and rewarding and beneficial experience. But you can also grab a camera, which you already have now, you know. An iPhone is better than the cameras I started shooting on when I was starting to make films. And you can go out and tell stories, and there is incredible resources to help you get started and how to think about how you might approach telling a story. So I would encourage people to get their hands, 
you know, dirty themselves. It doesn't mean they shouldn't go and study formally, but um, definitely explore and leverage the resources that are out there and go out and just try and tell a story, you know, in your backyard. It doesn't have to be big. You know, there are great stories everywhere. There is change happening everywhere. There are important questions to be asked everywhere. And uh, we're actually um, launching uh, a new program in a, in a little while, which um, I guess in a couple of months, and it's going to be a, a curriculum based around how kids in high school can tell stories and make their own documentary film. It's a project-based learning um, initiative um, so that they can take a film, make a film they would want to put in a time capsule 100 years later. What is the story they want to tell about their own lives, about their families, about something that means something to them, and keep it for a future generation to look at. So that's something we've been thinking about, too, is how can we take what we've done and create an experience for kids to then learn how to make a documentary, ask the questions that we ask, and use that as inspiration to tell their own story. So if you guys check out the website, follow us on Twitter, you'll get notifications about all this new material being launched. We have time for probably a couple more questions. No? Yeah, over here. Do you do uh, touring around to different libraries or universities giving this similar sort of presentation for inspiration? I, I have done, and I, and I do do that. I, I uh, also work in, in more intimate settings with students, uh, master classes, um, uh, people who are studying film or storytelling, or people who are working in uh, fields of education or even environmental science or uh, social entrepreneurship really runs the gamut um, how storytelling can engage people to think differently. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do. do so support. if we contacted you, say, is there a contact me button? Yes, there, there's a contact me button. OK. <laughs> Just yeah, to kind of get a feeling for your schedule and how we can oh, maybe work oh, something you. out. Thank you. <laughs> My agent will contact you shortly. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, if you guys don't have a question, I'll tell you a little story about one of the films you saw, because I think this is, if you do end up using these films in your classroom or wanting to share one, there, there's a really happy, um, happy uh, ending to, to the story you saw of Marie and Jennifer. Um, I made that film last year, premiered uh, online, uh, I guess last August. And um, one of the things that was really sad when I was down there filming uh, with Marie and her family was the fact that none of the other members of her family and her tribe were interested in learning her language. She was in her house all day long, alone with a lot of time, or with her daughter Jennifer working on the dictionary. There are 100 members of the tribe, pretty much all of them are connected, uh, a part of their family, and they weren't interested. And when the film premiered, they gathered all the family around in the living room, and they watched the film. And it was the first time that the family had actually seen and experienced the value of what Marie was doing. And it transformed the community and the family uh, and made them realize the value that the language has had. And as you can see, they started teaching the classes, but it's really become more than that. They, I guess, valued her for the first time. So as a filmmaker, it was really rewarding to know that the little bit I was able to capture and share, was able to ignite a spark within the family. And um, you know, when we talk about in how stories can inspire and engage, you know, it's important for everyone, but especially students, to learn the power that a story really has. The words that I was said at the beginning of the presentation, to me, they're not rhetoric. They're, to me, they're lived experience that I've had, is the power of a story. That even people who know that story really well or think they do, who know, think they know about the language and what it is and what it isn't, when it's presented in a story, it can change everything. So I just want to share that with you. Thank you.